So a few facts that are not so pleasant to hear. Uh, our global population has not reached its maximum. Uh, it's got a long way to go. We're at eight some billion right now and estimates are it'll stabilize out between 10 and 11 billion, but some estimates go much higher than that. And it depends on a number of factors. Um, and so this is important as background information as we think about our land and water resources and managing water for, for agriculture. Too many people in the world are already hungry or are food insecure. Uh, 800 million, uh, that's one in 10 people uh, in 2020 uh, are, are face hunger every day. And an, an even greater number than that, two point, almost two and a half billion people have some level of food insecurity. And food insecurity means they might not know where that next meal has come from, coming from, uh, they might have to skip a meal um, and so forth. So this food insecurity um, is, um, impacts many, many more people. Uh, even more people are impacted by water scarcity, the lack of water in some way, um, which is a very, very serious uh, statistics statistic. And so the Earth's resources, uh, as I'm trying to demonstrate here, are under extreme pressure and they are being used, already being used uh, unsustainably. Climate change, and we'll talk about that a little more, is making things even more challenge, challenging in many, many ways. And um, our very survival depends on sustainable resource use. Uh, if we're living on 1.7 planets worth of resources right now, um, how long will we be able to sustain that into the future? Not indefinitely, that's, that's for sure. So here's a little quiz for you. Um, what are the basic things that a plant needs or a crop needs to grow? What basic things are needed to grow a plant for food? Throw a, throw a response in the chat if you'd like to. Please participate in the chat room or maybe in this uh, room. Oh yeah, that's right. We're not all, it's not completely virtual. We have some people there as well. Uh, so yeah, feel free to raise your hand or just unmute yourself and, uh, and. Um, um, One answer. Water. Maybe water. Water. Sun, uh, sunlight. Yes. Or, or some minerals like nitrogen or something like that. Minerals, nutrients. So, yes. Some minerals. Okay. Others from you? Land? Oh, also there's a uh, in yeah. chat. Water, soil, yeah. nutrient. Yeah, water, soil, sunlight. Yeah. And uh NPK and food. Yes, exactly. You got it. Those are the, the things on my short list as well. And so I want to you know, spend the rest of the time talking about water um, and a little bit about a little bit about soil, mostly about water. Um, we know we can grow plants without soil, but the plants do need something for structure. So if it's not the soil, it's going to be something else that we provide um, um, to support the roots. When we think about water in agriculture specifically, um, you know, the topic of water is huge. And if we're talking about water supply and drinking water and all of that, but we're limiting our focus here uh, this morning to just water and agriculture. We think about providing for needs of the crop, as you just mentioned. Um, that's one aspect of water, and I call that water management. And secondly, um, when we think about water and agricultural systems, we also have to think about managing rainfall, managing irrigation, uh, that is water that we might apply to the, to the soil or the field, managing drainage uh, with the idea of protecting the environment. Uh, protecting the environment that we're using to grow food, that is the soil that is sustaining our crop, but also protecting the downstream environment. And this picture that we see here is showing um, a farm that um, needs to do a better job of protecting the environment. You see the erosion here. Uh, that's going to affect soil productivity in the field. And that soil that leaves the field through erosion is going to impact downstream uh, downstream users of that water. So 
when I say water management and water quality, these are the things that, um, that I'm thinking about when I make that distinction. And so if I could first talk about water management um, for agriculture. And when I think of water management for agriculture, the first things that I'm thinking of are irrigation and drainage. Um, those are the, uh, the two most common ways that we manipulate water or manage water in, in uh, agricultural systems. Uh, sometimes we're also managing rainfall, that is to, um, um, to improve infiltration of water uh, so that we have more water in the soil for the crop. But irrigation and drainage are the things that, that come to mind. And if we, I wanna paint just a generic picture for you here. If you put yourself down anywhere in the world you have some pattern of precipitation. You know, if you're, in a, if you're in the Middle East, perhaps you have almost no precipitation. If you're in Indonesia, uh, you have a lot of precipitation and it varies everywhere you go in the world. But this is uh, just a generic figure. It could be anywhere, okay? So you have some pattern of precipitation uh, depending on where you are, where you're located in the world. Now, native vegetation, grass and trees and, and so forth, has a way of adapting and evolving um, to be matched up pretty well with the precipitation that occurs at that location. But when we try to grow something like a crop, oftentimes the water use for that, for that crop is not very well matched to the precipitation pattern uh, of, that, of that location. And so if we look at the, the green line here is the water use of the crop, during times of the year when we get more precipitation than the crop needs, there might be excess water to have to manage to deal with. That might mean we need a drainage system or, or at the very least we need to manage uh, so that we don't have erosion in the field. And there might be other times of the year when the water needs of the crop exceed what we're experiencing for, from uh, rainfall or precipitation. And in those times, uh, irrigation might be needed um, or some other means of, of providing for the crop. Well, if we look globally, there's a lot to digest here. I did provide a, a PDF of these slides um, that um, I hope has already been made available to you or uh, can be made available to you um, uh, at a later time. But uh, the circle over here on the, on, the, on the very left is all of the available, is all of the land um, that we use for agriculture. And then uh, this is the rain fed and irrigated agriculture represented by this circle right here. Now the 20% of our cropland that is irrigated globally supplies about 40% of our global food supply. That's how important these irrigated areas are and why it's so important that we meet all the irrigation demands globally that we need. And we're not doing that now. As the, as the table up here applies, um, um, this is a table that's focused on drainage needs, but uh, we're also not meeting all the irrigation needs as well. And so we're, we're uh, because we, generate so much food from our lands that are irrigated and drained, it's really important that we meet those, those needs of irrigation and drainage um, everywhere in the world. And that's one of the challenges as we look ahead to feeding a growing population. Some of the big issues that I see um, in facing agriculture in terms of water management are water scarcity, the lack of water, um, and water scarcity comes from a number of things. It comes from inefficient water use. It comes from uh, over uh, using our groundwater supplies, which is also a, a way of uh, inefficient use of water. It, it comes from a competition of water among different industrial, among different sectors of society, agriculture industry and the domestic sector. For example, in the United States, um, in the Western part of our country where it's drier, 
the demand for water, the competition for water is really, really high. Uh, in Colorado, for example, we have growing populations in Denver and other places. It's a beautiful place to live, um, but it's a very water short environment. And so as a city like Denver grows, it needs more water. Where does that water come from? It comes from the agricultural sector. And once a water, a drop of water moves from the agricultural sector to the urban sector, it's never going to go back. Those cities are never going to shrink in size. Um, and so competition for water, uh, that was one example among the different sectors is, is, is another aspect of water scarcity. Climate change is creating um, uh, water scarcity as well. Our precipitation patterns are changing. They're becoming more uncertain. Um, and so um, this is leading to water scarcity. Salinization of our soils is also a big, big problem worldwide, uh, making it more difficult to use water. And um, water that is uh, polluted um, is not going to be available for the uses that we intended for and it makes water uh, more scarce. As you read or study more about uh, water and a growing global population, you'll see this term, the water energy food nexus. And I'll have a, a couple more comments about this in future slides, but it has to do with the connectivity between these three sectors and how important that is. One Changing one thing affects the others. Um, and then water rights and access to water, uh, the legal uh, and management of water, um, as we look at that from place to place around the world, uh, is, creating, um, uh, is uh, creating many, many challenges for many people in the world. So water justice, environmental justice, is, is one term that's used to, um, to describe the fairness of, of the access to water. If we kind of look at things uh, regionally around the planet, starting in Asia over here, we see, um, and these lists could be longer for each region, but these are some of the big, some of the big topics that come up, uh, groundwater depletion, you know, in Asia and China, water pollution, water management is a challenge. Uh, down here in, um, uh, in Central and, and, and Southeast Asia, ir irrigation inefficiency, the need for modernization of, of irrigation systems, salinization and climate change. Climate change, in fact, could show up on every one of these, uh, every one of these regional lists. Uh, but these are just a couple of bullet points here. In Australia, drought, salinity, uh, and the allocation of water across different sectors. In Africa, access to water, water justice, um, climate change again, the development of irrigation where it's uh, to, to, to come to its full potential. South America is deforestation uh, and disruption of the water cycle be due to deforestation. Uh, again, water pollution and inefficient irrigation. In the United States, water scarcity, pollution, water allocation. Again, we could put climate change on every, on every region here. And then also for Europe, um, uh, is also experiencing a lot of challenges here. So um, some of these issues vary uh, by region, and many regions are experiencing many of the same problems as well, particularly climate change. In the Middle East, uh, extreme water scarcity, of course, a dependence on desalinization and transboundary water conflicts. I could put trans boundary water conflicts on the on the uh, on the table here for the U.S. as well. We have competition. Uh, you know, California is trying to get water from the Midwest and 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 so forth. So it's it's becoming very very challenging. You know, it turns out agriculture is both a cause of uh, water scarcity and also it's being impacted by water scarcity. Uh, we know we can't grow food without water, but um, agriculture is responsible for, you know, somewhere around 70% globally of fresh water uh, use, uh, up to 95% in some, in some countries. Uh, rivers, rivers support 25% uh, of our global food production. 
and the mismanagement of both surface and subsurface uh, water resources is, uh, again, uh, uh, making water scarcity uh, worse. This is a very crucial statistic during the last 100 years. Water use increase water use increased at twice the rate of population growth. So how long do you think we can sustain that kind of um, growth? Drought is the number one uh, crop stress that limits uh, yield worldwide. And uh, many, 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 many places are experiencing drought um, at an increased rate due to climate change. And uh, climate change is, is, of course, making water scarcity worse. Uh, many of us are experiencing higher temperatures, and that leads to more drought. Uh, and I have some more uh, uh, bullet points later on uh, with regard to climate change. Uh, even in my home state of Minnesota, um, where I live and work now, which is the Midwestern uh, part of the United States, the middle of the United States, uh, we're experiencing record droughts, um, our temperatures are higher, uh, our winters are warmer. Um, it's, it's been said that in a couple of decades, our climate will be more like the Southern United States instead of the Northern United States. So this is a, a graphic uh, put together by the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization, and it's showing the level of water stress due to ag the agricultural sector on a basin by basin basis. And, uh, you know, those areas that are in the blue um, are not experiencing the water stress, but everywhere else, yellow, orange, and red, um, we see lots of water stress um, all over the world. So it's, it's something that we're going to deal with in every region. And all of you are coming from different places. It's going to look a little different um, where you're from, but it's, if, if you're working in water, you're going to be working on, on some of these issues. As I mentioned, uh, climate change is increasing the risk for drought. And this is a, a World Resources Institute depiction of uh, the risks of drought worldwide. And again, uh, just about nobody is exempt from seeing an increased risk of, of drought uh, globally here. So in terms of water management, um, we need to figure out and when I say we, I'm really looking at all of you students because you're the ones who are gonna solve these problems. Um, we really need to think about <clears throat> reducing agriculture's water footprint. You may have heard the term climate smart agriculture, that is agriculture that's better matched uh, with, with climate, given that climate is changing. Um, producing more food or more crop per drop of water. So more crop per drop is, is one kind of fun way to say that. And uh, all kinds of techniques are being looked at depending on the, the region, depending on the country um, to produce more crop uh, with using less water. Um, also the, the, we're gonna need all hands on deck you know, my background is engineering, but we need agronomists, we need biologists, we need all of these disciplines to look at um, new crops and new, new, new types of, of plants that are more resistant to drought and that use less water. And we can't talk about resource use uh, without talking about food waste. Um, food waste is one of the biggest challenges and in fact, if, if you're looking for a topic to, um, to do some research on or something that can make a big impact, food waste is a really good one to look at um, because, you know, globally, we're probably at a, some, somewhere around a 40% uh, food waste level globally, and that can be higher or lower depending on where we are uh, in the world. But uh, half of all greenhouse gas emissions that come from agricultural systems can be attributed to food waste. So that's a big environmental impact. Um, and um, when, when we say food waste, I mean everything from the field all the way to the table. 
um, and everything in between. And so there's, there's um, loss and inefficiency and waste of, of, of those materials uh, at many, many places in the, in the uh, supply chain. All the way down to consumption where, you know, leaving food on your plate or not finishing the food that you've taken is uh, factors into that as well. Um, I'll tell you a little story um, with regard to food waste. Um, I have um, two children, they're grown now, but um, when they were in uh, grade school, I would volunteer when, when the school would take the kids to an environmental camp for a week um, for sort of an outdoor learning uh, laboratory. And um, there was a, like a kid canteen or like a, like a cafeteria where, the, where all the kids ate um, for all their meals. And there were big tables, you know, where eight or 10 students could sit at one table and there, the, the, the room was full of tables. And in the middle of the table, there was a small bucket. Nobody knew what the bucket was for. And as uh, the students were eating their first meal, and they were there for about a week, and the, um, one of the instructors was making announcements, they said, these buckets are for, at the end of the meal, any food that's left on your plate, we want you to put that into the bucket. Well, the students finished their meals and they scraped their extra food into the bucket and they said, okay, now we're gonna have a competition to see which bucket or which table has the least amount of food in it. So it was a food waste competition. And of course, those first couple of meals, those buckets were full of food. The students took too much food, it's a cafeteria, you know, where they're just going down the line and choosing food. So students were choosing too much food and not finishing it all. By the end of the week, the buckets were empty and didn't even need to be washed um, because the students were so tuned in to reducing their food waste. So it was just a very simple demonstration to the, to the young students um, about how to reduce their, their own food waste uh, from consumption. In terms of our own consumption, you know, a lot of water goes into our food. Uh, anywhere between uh, two to 5,000 liters of water are required um, to, for our daily food consumption, depending on where we live and what we eat. And a more plant-based diet will be less demanding of water. In fact, if you compare a serving of lentils with a serving of beef, you know, uh, we use about 10 times more water to produce that beef than we do the lentils. Lentils are a legume, like a pea uh, or a bean. Um, and, um, and so a more plant-based diet is one way of conserving water and using water uh, more efficiently. So education is going to be really important um, when it comes to helping people transition. And I'm thinking about transitioning over generations uh, to a more plant-based diet. Um, of course, we're very guilty in the United States here, even though we see many, many more people uh, with vegetarian diets and vegan diets, um, we still have a lot of people that have a, a very heavy demand of, of meat in their diet. Um, and so uh, my country has a long way to go in terms of uh, you know, leaning, having a more plant-based diet, but the world is going to have to uh, go this route if we want to use the, you know, live within the resources that are available to us. I teach an online course in global water sustainability. Um, it's a course that's, uh, it's an undergraduate course and students from all different majors take this course. And students are amazed at when they find out how much water they're using with their lifestyle. And um, I asked them, what is one thing you can do to, uh, you know, to reduce your water use? And they come up with all kinds of things. Uh, one of the more popular things is to do uh, what, they, what students call Meatless Monday. And they, for those students that do eat meat, they take one day of the week where they don't eat any meat at all, just to kind of get used to uh, depending on, on meat um, less.
I mentioned the water energy food nexus, and this is a slide, you can see it in the handout um, uh, that you'll have, but it, it's important to realize that these three sectors, uh, food production, water, and energy are interrelated. And so as we think about sustaining ourselves on this planet, we need to think about all of these at the same time because they're all related. Um, you know, uh, both energy, producing energy and food, both take water um, uh, to do that. Uh, we use also water to produce energy uh, straight from water. Um, Food-wise, we grow energy crops. So these three sectors are highly related. And um, um, we need to kind of work on all of them at the same time uh, going forward. Um, and in terms of thinking about the, the nexus, that is the connecting, connecting aspects of these three, uh, this impacts resource scarcity. So um, conflicts for our resources, for water and land and so forth, um, are, are really important to reduce those conflicts. And, and they, more conflict leads to more resource scarcity. Uh, climate change, as I mentioned, is impacting water availability. It's going to affect agricultural production and energy production. And so we need to be thinking about integrated resource management. We need to manage all of these and other sectors uh, to, um, to optimize and, and make more efficient our, our resource use and minimize the trade-offs. That is, those things that we need to sacrifice um, uh, to live on our planet. And then technological innovation is going to be very, very important um, um, as we go forward. And so advances in technology uh, that you are working on and that we are working on uh, are really going to factor into our sustainability. Um, I'm just looking at the chat here, uh, poor internet. Um, if, I hope I'm coming through okay. Can our moderator let me know if, if the internet connection is uh, affecting the uh, the presentation here at all? The presentation is smoothly. We can uh, enjoy okay. your presentation. Good. Okay. Um, so maybe some of our virtual attendees are, are experiencing difficulties. Okay. Yeah. So climate change has a lot of effects on agriculture. Um, and these are just some of the big ones that you already know, uh, but I'm, so I'm just reminding you. Temperature increases, sometimes temperature decreases, but temperature increases are going to reduce crop yields. Are they gonna put heat stresses on crops? Uh, crops that are relying on precipitation to meet their water demands um, are going to, it's gonna be more difficult because precip pre uh, precipitation patterns are changing and the increase of drought and floods are leading to crop damage. Uh, water supply for irrigation is going to become more uncertain in the face of, of climate change. Extreme weather events. I wonder how many of you are experiencing this uh, where you live. Um, it seems like extreme events now are becoming everyday events. Uh, and I, we have a long list of those um, in the United States and even in, even in the central United States. Um, extreme weather events are leading to more crop damage. Um, uh, climate change is, is, is uh, leading to even more soil degradation, increased erosion from more intensive rainfall, um, and um, salinization, uh, salt-affected soils from rising sea levels and increased evapotranspiration. Pests and diseases. Uh, you know, because the temperature regimes are changing around the planet, the range of pests uh, is increasing and the range of diseases. Uh, I'm, I'm a little bit familiar with the coffee producing regions of Sumatra and I've traveled there many times and, and they're experiencing um, more pests and diseases now moving up into higher elevations in the mountains where coffee is grown uh, due to climate change. And also the intensity of those pests and diseases are becoming, are becoming greater. Climate change, is, climate change is affecting water availability. Um, it's affecting carbon dioxide levels. Sometimes this, is, this can increase 
um, uh, crop yield. But oftentimes that increase is limited by uh, nutrient availability or water availability. And then shifts in the growing season. Uh, planting and harvesting cycles are changing with the change in climate. And this, this has vast implications for uh, agricultural productivity. And if the length, length of the growing season changes, gets longer or shorter, again, this, uh, this can be very difficult um, in terms of agricultural productivity. So the, the effects of climate change on agricultural systems are, are it, it affects them at all levels, top to bottom, and, and especially anything having to do with water is impacted in, in quite a big way. Now I want to turn here to um, uh, the other aspect of water that we that I introduced earlier, and that is water quality for agriculture. Even though I'm separating them out uh, to talk about them individually, water management and water quality are, are both very, very tightly connected um, together. Um, in terms of water quality, in terms of the big picture, what we're seeing is um, the impacts from agricultural systems as uh, pollutants and nutrients are being lost from our agricultural lands to downstream places. Uh, those nutrients and chemicals and so forth are, are uh, leading to pollution, leading to eutrophication, uh, and also the loss of topsoil, as I mentioned earlier, uh, is reducing soil productivity, and it is a pollutant once it once it enters the, the uh, stream or the ditch. Um, eutrophication is the process whereby a water body, either an inland water body or a coastal water body, becomes um, over, um, how can I say this? It sort of becomes fertilized or nutrients enter that water body in excess of what is needed. And this process of eutrophication is a process whereby when nutrients enter a water body, um, algae form in that water body in response to that addition of nutrients. And once the algae have consumed uh, the nutrients, the algae die. And when the algae die, they're consumed by bacteria. And those bacteria, when they consume the algae, um, they take oxygen out of the water uh, in their, in their uh, consumption process. And that then, that reduction in oxygen impacts the, the uh, aquatic ecosystem, whether it's a freshwater or, or a saltwater ecosystem. Now this uh, graphic here is showing coastal or marine hypoxia. Hypoxia means low oxygen. And so these areas that you see, they're very tiny dots, these yellow dots and these red dots are areas where coastal hypoxia or low oxygen have been measured um, all around the coastlines around the planet. And if we look, in the, we look down here, the yellow dots have to do with eutrophic conditions, that is this over-fertilization condition uh, that is reducing the oxygen. The red dots are actually hypoxic, where oxygen levels in that water now are less than two parts per million, less than two milligrams per liter or parts per million. At that level, marine organisms or inland water organisms uh, cannot survive. Um, and so we see all around the planet uh, these hypoxic areas. And the green areas and yellow areas are areas of agricultural activity. And so agricultural activity and the runoff from these agricultural lands, the nutrients in that runoff and so forth, are leading to this coastal hypoxia and also inland uh, lakes and, and rivers hypoxia all around the world. And the, the impacts on those aquatic ecosystems are are huge, and that affects the food chain all the way up and down. Um, and um, as we know, our human existence is, is dependent on coral reefs and aquatic diversity as well. And so it's gonna 
it's going to impact um, the human civilization as well. But this map just shows how extensive this problem is. It's a planetary problem. Um, almost every country where there's intensive agriculture has a hypoxic uh, area to, to deal with on its coastline. Now in the United States, um, we're dealing with hypoxia down here in the Gulf of Mexico. By the way, here's, um, here's where I am right now. I am right here in Minnesota. This is the state of Minnesota right here. And the University of Minnesota is right here. Um, this yellow area outlined in red is the Mississippi River Basin, the Mississippi uh, watershed. The Mississippi River is one of the largest rivers in the world. It's nowhere near as large as, as you know, the Nile or, or uh, uh, rivers like that. Um, but it is a major river in, in, in the, um, in the in, on Earth. And uh, the watershed is almost, as, you know, almost the whole part of our country uh, drains into the Mississippi River and into the Gulf of Mexico. These green and yellow areas are areas of agricultural productivity. Um, and so we are very concerned about hypoxia in the Gulf of Mexico here, especially in the northern part of the Midwest here, we're very dependent on artificial drainage. I mentioned drainage earlier in my talk. We're very dependent on these artificial drainage systems because our soils are very wet and they don't drain well um, naturally. And so these artificial drainage systems exacerbate or they worsen the loss of nutrients from agricultural fields. You can imagine if you have nitrogen in high concentrations in the root zone here, and I'm hoping you can see my laser pointer, uh, uh, nitrogen uh, and phosphorus in high concentrations in the root zone, you can very easily get into these drains into the ditches and then on into the river and down into the Gulf of Mexico. So these are the sub basins of the Mississippi River and you can see that um, they have a, uh, they play a large part in the transport of nitrogen to the Gulf of Mexico, which creates a hypoxia here. And so a lot of my work in, uh, in the Northern part of the Midwest, and here you can see the outline of Minnesota a little more clearly on this map, um, a lot of my work has to do with uh, mitigating these impacts, the loss of nitrogen and phosphorus from our agricultural lands. And in particular, because I'm in the upper Midwest, the northern Midwest, the drainage systems are the, are the key part that we have to look at. And so that's some of the work that I do. Um, I'll talk about that more in just a minute. The size of the hypoxic zone in the Gulf of Mexico is measured every year. And that's the, these green bars indicate the size in square miles. Sorry, I don't have it in uh, metric units. I apologize for that. Uh, square miles. Um, this is the hypoxia task force has a goal of 5,000 square kilometers to limit the size of the hypoxic zone uh, to that level. And you can see that we're nowhere close to meeting that goal um, at all. So we have so much work to do. Um, and what we're working on, at least in my field of agricultural engineering, is we're working on practices that will, um, that will mitigate these water quality impacts. And you're hearing, my, you're hearing my little kitty cat here that also wants my attention. Um, and so it's okay. I'm giving a presentation right now. Hi, she, wants, she wants my attention. <laughs> Um, our states in the, um, in the United States have, have set goals for minimizing nutrient losses, and we are nowhere close to meeting our goals um, that we have set out for ourselves. So we have a lot of work to do. And this is just a snapshot of lots of different practices that we're working on um, to do that. One practice I want to just mention that I've done, worked a lot on is uh, this idea of managed drainage. So the picture I showed just a minute ago, the illustration did not have this structure uh, in the drainage system. It was a straight pipe that went out. And so 
This is a water control structure that, al that allows the farmer to manage the water, that is, create a water table that's a little bit higher, a little bit shallower, a little bit closer to the ground surface than would be the case if this structure weren't there. And in doing this, one, it creates more water for the crop if managed properly, and two, it reduces the overall volume of drainage that leaves the field. And so when we reduce the drainage volume, we reduce the nutrients that are lost in the water, and it, it has the effect of bringing down nutrient losses by anywhere from 15 to 60%, depending on the year. And so it can be very effective. This is another little illustration of uh, what that would look like as we have a topography now in the field, a sloping field, and we put these structures in here to, again, uh, try to control the water table in our drainage system. And we have, um, part of my work is, um, you know, doing education out in the field. And so we have field days where we invite farmers and we invite uh, conservation professionals to come out and look at the work that we're doing. These are on-farm demonstrations in some cases. In some cases, they are uh, on experiment stations. Um, and so you're seeing an aerial view, a drone view here of a, of a field day that we have. This is one of our research sites for controlled drainage. And this is another, a different practice. Uh, you're still seeing this structure here, but this is a practice called a bioreactor. And uh, a bioreactor works by removing nitrogen through a biological process as it, as it leaves the field uh, from the drainage system. Here's another example of a practice that we've worked on. This is a traditional drainage ditch in the Midwestern United States. And you see that it's a very steep slope sides. It's, a, it's a, basically a V-notch, a V-notch, um, a V kind of a, a, a shaped ditch. And these are, uh, they're efficient for moving water, but they're not, as, they're not as biologically active as a natural stream. Because they're so hydraulically efficient, uh, there isn't much opportunity for the biology of this ditch, that is, uh, the, you know, the bacteria that's there and the fungi and so forth, to interact with the water because it's so hydraulically efficient. And so what we're doing is redesigning these ditches so that we have a main channel down here that's smaller, that takes the frequent smaller flows, but now we also have a grass bench here, as you see right here. And so now we have an opportunity for water in this ditch to interact with the vegetation much more. And so we're, we're, we are restoring ecological capacity back into these water conveyance systems, into these ditches. Um, not, the, not the ecological capacity of a natural stream, but a much greater ecological capacity than, uh, than just a straight drainage ditch. And so putting some ecological function back in the landscape is another approach that um, agricultural engineers are taking in the United States anyway to, um, to minimize the loss of nutrients uh, downstream. So looking ahead towards a sustainable future is you and I, we need to work together to do uh, everything we possibly can do to increase sustainability of our resources. And part of that means taking away the things that um, that create unsustainability, um, a growing demand for food, making sure people have the right kind of income for their for the economic uh, well-being and, and welfare, and um, reliance on outdated technologies. You know, all of those things need to change. Uh, we need to work together to improve our resource resource efficiency, to protect and improve our soil and water resources. We need to develop alternate sources of uh, food sources and evolved diets. Um, you know, the yeah, maybe in your part of the world, uh, you know, there's less reliance on meat and more reliance on vegetables, but that has to change in, in, in other places um, in, in the world, for sure. We need to reduce crop loss, crop losses, grain losses, inefficiencies in the food transportation system and food waste in general, we need to reduce these, these things. And in, in, in general, we need to work together toward uh, achieving the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals. 
There are a couple of success stories if we look around, uh, probably many success stories. I just have a couple of here. You know, if we look at the Netherlands, uh, they're growing food so intensively. Um, they committed a number of years ago to growing twice as much food using half the resources uh, at that time. And they really committed to it um, in, a, in a big way. And so they're using greenhouses and sort of vertical agricultural systems. They've cut their water use tremendously and they've uh, greatly reduced or eliminated using uh, chemicals. And uh, the Netherlands, at, 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 when I put this slide together, at least they had become the number two exporter of food. That is by the value of that food, not by the volume, but by the value. Um, and the U.S. is the number one exporter of food, and the Netherlands is 270 times smaller than the U.S. So think about that. Think about if the United States were able to achieve the, the efficiencies of the Netherlands on the vast uh, land resources that we have. So that's, that's kind of a motivational example uh, for all of us there. Here's another example uh, in Asia, uh, climate smart agriculture. Um, this is in Vietnam, uh, rice culture here. We know that your, um, um, rice uses a lot of water to grow. And I know there's research in Indonesia as well, looking at uh, water management of rice and using less water and managing water tables. And uh, rice paddy fields are also a significant source of, of uh, uh, nitrous oxide, which is a powerful uh, greenhouse gas, methane as well. Um, and so they're using um, uh, variable water uh, um, demand for uh, looking at uh, managing their water and combining that with, with other practices to cut down their methane emissions by 50% and their water use down by 40% while experiencing yield increases. Okay, so uh, there's some great examples out there. Just just Google them or or, or look on uh, one of the AI tools, and you'll see many many examples of where where we are, uh, where climate smart agriculture and uh, good resource uses um, in, are are being are happening right now. Here's just a headline from uh, you know, World Bank support of. of agricultural sector in Indonesia. So funds are becoming available worldwide, you know, to, to increase sustainability, to strengthen technologies, um, and to uh, enhance modernization and, um, and agricultural productivity. And so the question I would ask all of you or pose to all of you is, what kind of success stories are you working on? What are you helping to create? Um, as we think about our, our water resources uh, for agriculture. And as I said before, you students are our greatest asset. Uh, you are going the ones who are going to be solving these problems. Um, my generation and before, you know, we solved some problems, but we also created a lot of problems in solving those problems. Um, we need your, um, we need your brain power you know, to, um, to help solve these problems in the future. Um, so really take advantage of the time you have in school right now. Um, courses like this one, taking advantage of this opportunity, I can't tell you how valuable it is. Um, expanding your knowledge beyond, you know, just what you're experiencing in your home university is really, really important. So prepare yourselves to the absolute best of your ability because you're really going to need it once you get out there solving some real world problems. Get involved in research as much as possible. Some of you have research that is um, a requirement for your degree, but go beyond that. Um, talk to faculty, uh, university professors, um, and others. Find somebody who's willing to mentor you, who take, take you into their lab, let you do research, uh, just to learn what research is all about. It's, it's really, really important. I've got a couple of just uh, snapshots here from some of our students and some other students at other universities. Uh, I brought students to Indonesia for, for a few years, right up until the pandemic. Uh, I brought um, groups of 20, 20 to 25 students to Indonesia for a study abroad uh, course for three weeks in January. We visited Gajah University um, and other, other places as well. 
these kinds of opportunities, uh, do take advantage of them everywhere you can find them. And uh, reach out to professors and uh, other professionals for mentoring and, and experience beyond the experience you're going to get in the classroom. And with that, I may have gone beyond my time. I hope I didn't uh, exceed it by too much. Um, but I look forward to some discussion with you. And again, thank you to to the organizers of the of the uh, of the event here for the invitation to participate. It's really an honor for me to to be part of this. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Prof. Gary. Please give applause for his magnificent presentation. It is such an interesting uh, material that even. One of the most I remember is marine hypoxia. Where when we hear hypoxia, it's kind of like health issue, right? But actually, in our environment, we also hear marine hypoxia. So before we continue to our answer, uh, answer and question session, the participants in the Zoom can uh, raise your hand for asking and also write the question in the chat room. And also for the participants in on-site room. Uh, would like to ask questions. One, two, three. Okay, so there are three questions <laughs> in this room. Um. So. Okay. Thank you. My name is. Hello. Yeah, my name is Abu Hurairah, and I come from Pakistan. So I have like three main questions. First of all, I would like uh, the clarification on when you men mentioned the salinization. So I would like to ask that it's caused by natural phenomena or were you specifically like mentioning that is a result of the practices done by us? And second is the use of tech and modern techniques that enable cro crops to grow with less water. What effects will they have on the outcome of like the crops and food quality and third is that um, it's it's an idea like uh, why don't we use the salination the salination process to get uh, unlimited amount of water from the sea ocean rather than um, like uh, adapting to other methods why don't we use that method like it's possible nowadays so these are my three main questions thank you Okay, thank you for the question. Um, would you like to answer it directly, Prof. Gary, or we accumulate the questions? Um, well, I defer to you. Um, I'm, I didn't take notes uh, on the questions, and so it might be easier to to answer directly. Okay. Um, so you asked about, you asked three questions. One is about satellization. Is it happening from natural processes? Yeah. You asked about you asked about using um, seawater and the the, the uh, desalinization of seawater to provide unlimited water for us, and then about um, finding crops that use uh, less water. What will that mean in terms of quality uh, of food? Did I get those questions about right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those three. The first is, uh, is it salinization is uh, based on nature or anthropogenic causes? The second is that how modern techniques affect the water quality and water management? And the third is about desalination. Thank you for those those uh, great questions. They're all very important uh, questions. Um, and I'll try to just answer them briefly um, or respond to them briefly. Um, salinization within the soil is uh, sometimes occurs naturally. There are there are some soils that are uh, that have um, sodium and and have some natural occurrence of salt. Um, however, in most cases where where it's really a problem, it is occurring because of human activity. Uh, and, you know, an agricultural system is really a managed ecosystem. So we're managing nutrients, we're managing water, we're trying to create an environment for the crop. The crop itself is, is, a, is, a, is a part of the ecosystem. And it is, um, it's very challenging 
to manage an ecosystem um, as well as Mother Nature can manage an ecosystem. And so as we apply more water or less water to a field or to a soil, all kinds of things can happen. Um, but the buildup of salts in the soil often has to do with when we irrigate a soil, if we don't provide enough water to irrigate or don't provide adequate drainage, the natural up upward movement of, of water in the soil profile as part of the evaporation and transpiration process can bring salts closer to the surface of the ground and they can accumulate there. And this is happening, uh, in fact, some ancient civilizations collapsed because of salinization. Um, and so mismanagement or improper management of, of water and drainage in some cases uh, leads to uh, salinization. And um, uh, those soils, unless they're managed in a different way, can become unusable. Um, we're seeing some of this in the United States. Uh, and, and there's quite a bit of it in, in um, Australia. And there are many num number of pockets around the world where, where this is really challenging. So it is kind of a human induced, uh, a human, um, a human induced problem, even though it does occur naturally in, in some cases. Um, so the next is about um, using, uh, you know, different crops that are more water tolerant uh, or, or, or more drought tolerant, need less water. Um, you know, I, I think it's safe to assume that whatever we grow for food, we need to produce in sufficient quantity and sufficient quality. Um, and, um, you know, if we're trying to manage our soil and water resources so that we're changing, we're changing crops, we're looking for new crops, we still need to think about, you know, protein and, and caloric requirements of humans. Uh, so I don't think that there's no reason to think that crop quality is necessarily going to be worse. Um, but uh, we know that we can't sustainably produce what we're producing now. Um, uh, at the levels we're producing now with the way we man currently manage resources. So that has to change. And there may be sacrifices. We may have to make some sacrifices to do that. Um, crop quality could be one sacrifice that, that, that needs to be made. Um, but um, I think the proper assumption is that, you know, um, the quality of what we grow will have to be as good or better you know, in the future, even though we're looking for new ways, uh, new plants and new, new, new things to grow that, that um, need less water. Uh, and then thirdly was, um, uh, what was the third one? Oh, desalinization. Yeah, desalinization. Uh, I have no doubt that one day in the future, uh, humans will uh, depend much, much more on the desalin desalinization of seawater um, for to meet their freshwater needs. Um, it, it's just hard to believe, that, you know, looking way into the future that we're not going to have to do much, much more, um, you know, deriving fresh water from, from seawater. It's very, very expensive to do now. It's very energy intensive. And so some of the more well-to-do uh, Middle Eastern countries, you know, that also have a uh, struggle with meeting their water demands, um, they are going to that expense, uh, you know, and depending on seawater to meet their freshwater needs. Uh, so they're kind of the exception right now. But for that to occur in general, uh, in many places around the world, um, we're going to have to solve some of our energy needs. Um, at the same time, we look at our water demands. Remember, think about the food, energy, water nexus. Um, right now, it's so expensive to do that we can't do it um, all over the world. But the human race in the future, 
50, 100, whatever years in the future, I'm sure we'll be doing much, much more of it. But we'll have, we'll be doing different things to produce the energy as well at that time. So th those, that's my uh, speculation there in terms of using seawater. Okay, thank you, Prof. Giri, for the answer. Uh, for Abu, is it enough or do you want to reply? Okay, thank you so much, Professor Giri. That answers my question. And yeah, thank you. Okay, Um, second question. I see the people. Yeah, please. Okay, first of all, we are very delighted and grateful to having you, Professor. Genuinely, we have got some valuable knowledge from your expertise. So thank you very much. My name is Mahmoud. I am from Bangladesh. So my question is, given the urgent need to reduce agriculture's water footprint amidst growing global water scarcity, so what multifaceted approaches can be employed to balance high agriculture productivity with sustainable water use? Thank you. Okay, thank you uh, for the question. So, Prof. Giri, please. What approach can be we used to balance the high productivity with the sustainable water uh, usage? Yeah, thank you for the question. It's a very, very good question. Um, you know, I think first we need to look at where the inefficiencies lie and how can we use the water that we're using more efficiently. Um, so that's one thing. And that can lead us to many, many different aspects um, and different, different technologies, uh, different approaches, different management um, of our water. If we just look at, you know, where are where do the inefficiencies lie? So that will lead to obviously, if we increase our resource efficiency, um, we're going to be doing more with the water that we have. Uh, so that will be helpful, and that's going to look different. Every agricultural system will look different. Um, so there won't be one general recipe for how do we reduce inefficiency. Um, that'll have to be dependent on the region um, and, and, and what the needs are, what's happening there. It would look different for the Midwestern United States than it would look for California. It'll look different in Bangladesh than it would in Vietnam or Indonesia or India. Um, so reduce the inefficiencies first, find what those are. Um, sometimes it's infrastructure, sometimes it's management. Um, um, it, it can be lots of things. Um, <clears throat> we talked about water quality. So water scarcity and, and the lack of water sometimes has to do with um, water not being fit for use uh, because of pollution. So mitigating, lessening, eliminating um, the pollution of water will also help um, manage that resource better. I know that in uh, in certain places in the United States, um, uh, farmers can't use the water to do surface irrigation because uh, they use techniques that involve um, actually touching the water. They have to get in and set valves and set siphon tubes and so forth. And the water has too much bacteria in it and sometimes can't be used. Um, even though the crop would be fine, but the human human uh, interaction with the water is where the problem is. So looking at water quality and, and, uh, is, is another important aspect. So those are just some, some things I think that uh, come to mind as we start, you know, looking at, you know, more crop per drop uh, or better use of our, our water resources. Okay, thank you, Prof. Gary. Uh, for Mahmoud? Yeah, thank you very much. I got my answer. Thanks. Yeah. So, 
the question is interesting that the issue is facing by all of uh participants, especially all of the nations, not only in Bangladesh, not only in Indonesia, not only in USA, but we hear the issue that water scarcity or even water quality but we have some um, obligation to fulfill our food supply right but as Prof. Gary said that how we can approach to balance the high productivity water needs we have to eliminate the insufficiency right Prof. Gary you mentioned like that uh, a lot of aspects uh, like resource efficiency, technology, sustainability, overcoming the insustainability for global aspects, and also water quality. As uh, Mahmoud asking, uh, may I want to ask one interesting question that we know uh, in your slide, you mentioned about, about maybe 20% of um, global food production is using rivers as the water source. But we facing that uh, river is also one of the main source for clean water, for irrigation, but we are facing water pollution. So could you give us some uh, maybe suggestion or something about that issue? Yes, um, thank you. Um... These are very um, these are very deep questions. Um, you know, um, these are really good questions. All all of your questions have been great. Um, you know, it's very challenging when we start thinking about multiple sectors. You know, just think about a river, and you have urban use of that water. Uh, you have withdrawal of that water for urban use for you know household supply. You have withdrawal of that water for energy production and industry, industrial sector. Um, and uh, you have withdrawal that water for food production as well. And all of those different sectors also have a waste stream, you know, of water. Um, so they withdraw water and they put water back, usually in a lower water quality than, than you know, what they took out. And this is where the challenge is. Um, the challenge is one, um, dealing on a sector by sector basis uh, and having each sector do its job at um, preserving the value of the resource, you know, not affecting it so bad that somebody else can't use that water. Um, and then having the right legal and political framework so that this sort of multi-sectoral management uh, can work uh, to the benefit of everybody. You know, if, if, if industry gets to take all the water and they put it back in, in, in polluted, then everybody suffers. You know, if agriculture takes all the water, well, great, they, they produce food, but, you know, the industrial sector dies and the economy dies. Um, and uh, and so forth. So uh, it's 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 really really challenging um, when you think about all of that at the same time. And that's why I said your question is so deep because it's um, it it involves not only um, you know engineering, uh, but it involves sociology and politics and economics and and uh, and, and all of the disciplines. Um, and we, you know, I don't think anybody has it just right anywhere. Everybody is struggling. Every, every society, every city is dealing with these same challenges. You know, um, every sector needs water, no matter where you live, no matter where you are, you know, every sector needs water. Um, and, um, uh, and it's important for every, you know, every water use, every sector to uh, uh, to do the best job it can at at minimizing its its pollution, if not eliminating it altogether. You know, in the United States, we have um, the Environmental Protection Agency was formed back in the 1970s uh, when our rivers became so polluted 
that there were rivers that actually caught on fire. They were, they were so polluted, you know, back then, back in the, you know, the early industrial area, early industrial uh, time of our country's development, you know, rivers were just, they were the place where you d disposed of things. That was the place where you threw it away. You know, the chemicals, the everything, just put it into the river and it'll flow away and, and be gone. And uh, some of our rivers got so polluted that they caught on fire and um, um, multiple times. And, you know, that led to a, a change in the consciousness of, of uh, an awareness of our, of our whole society. And that, that led to um, the, the political pressure to do to form something like the Environmental Protection Agency, and now the regulations are very, 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 very tight, and we haven't solved all the problems, but but things have improved quite a bit. We still have many, many problems um, in terms of resource use, but um, but the water pollution issues have have greatly improved. Anyway, very, very, we could talk. A long time about about these challenges, but it's a very very good good question. I like the way you're thinking. Yeah, thank you, Prof. Getty. I agree with you that this challenge is massive global issue actually, and it's involved multi sectoral aspect, not only agriculture but also urban industrial or even we may be familiar with EPA, United uh, Stage uh, uh, Agency that. Focusing on Environmental Protection Agency, it's EPA. So I hear that social awareness and political pressure also become the main uh, point, not only water pollution. And the, the third question will be delivered, I think, the third person here. Yours. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, please. Hello, I'm Gia from the University of the Philippines, majoring in agroforestry. And I just want to ask that um, there are several technological solutions to um, land use problems and um, general agriculture production problems like um, hydroponics, aquaponics. I was just wondering if they are more water efficient than the conventional way of farming. Okay, thank you. So uh, how about hydroponic and other modern techniques? Is it more efficient than the tr conventional ones? Yeah. Yeah, another great question. Some of those um, sort of high-tech, uh, you know, approaches and techniques are in fact more water efficient because they're, there's much greater control over the resources. Um, you know, if you look at a hydroponic production system, they can just recycle the water, uh, you know, over and over again. Um, and um, uh, they have such a high level of control over all the factors of uh, production that, um, you know, they can fine tune uh, to a much greater degree um, and minimize waste minimize pollution. Um, you know, it's even those systems though, you know, if you, uh, depending on what you're growing hydroponically, let's say it's a vegetable, it still has a water demand, a water use that it needs, whether it's growing in the soil or growing in a, uh, in a, in a pipe, in a hydroponic, hydroponic system. It still needs a certain amount of water to produce a, a, a vegetable or a tomato. And um, even though we have a greater degree of control over the water resources and we can minimize the waste, um, which is really, really important, uh, we still probably in the, in the future will need to continue to look for foods that use less water than other foods. We, even hydroponics probably won't eliminate the need to look for the most, grow the most water efficient tomato 
but that we can. Um, so the answer to your question is yes, we have much greater control, much greater efficiency, um, and we still need to evolve and adapt and adapt to, to our water resource needs. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, so is it okay? Okay, thank you. So, Prof. Gary, is it such an interesting uh, discussion? But um, three questions, and actually four questions from me. <laughs> um, and I also I would like to ask the participants in the Zoom if you have any questions, you can write or raise hand. And also participants in this room, do you have questions, more questions? about water pollutions, about water issue, because the discussion is very interesting. And also the presentation is really insightful for, for me and especially, but also for us up here. Last questions? Does the committee have a, did you get my um, PDF of my slides? No. Uh, I, I, think I, I still don't have it, but, but I, I will ask I, other committee. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I, I attached it um, um, would have been uh, last night, your time. Ah, okay. Uh, and uh, so please let me know if you don't have it, because I would like the participants to, to have it if, uh, if possible. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, I'll ask uh, the committee and asking for the materials. So no more questions. Okay. Okay, so um, maybe do you have any closing statement, Prof. Gary, about the issue that we're facing right now, especially water management, water quality in agriculture? Well, sure, thank you. Um, again, my, my, uh, a big thank you to, um, to the committee and the organizers uh, for the invitation uh, to present. Again, it, it's, it's an honor and a privilege for me uh, to be here and to meet all of you. I wish I could see all of your faces. Um, um, so thank you again for that. Um, you know, issues of water and, and agriculture are so, um, are linked so close to, you know, human survival. And, um, so I really want to encourage all of you to, you know, if, if, if this is your area of work, some of you I know are, are, are studying other, other aspects, but um, we're going to need all the good ideas that, that you might have. Um, old guys like me, I've already tried all my ideas and I, hopefully I've made a little bit of an impact. But uh, we're going to need all the new ideas that, that all of you can come up with. And so... I want you to, to um, as I mentioned in a previous slide, uh, uh, go above and beyond what your what the requirements for your degree might be. Uh, don't stop there. Uh, go above and beyond. Again, talk with your professors. Uh, meet with other students. Get involved in volunteer activities. Um, throw yourself at these problems because it's really going to take uh, all of us working together and um, all of your energy and all of your good ideas. So uh, take full advantage now while you're students because once you graduate and you go out into the working world, you're going to find that um, you have more constraints on your time uh, than you do now. And uh, that's going to that's going to affect your ability to, uh, you know, to put yourself out there and, and do some of the things that you could do now as a student. So take full advantage while you're students and um, really invest yourself in these problems. And like I said, go above and beyond whatever the degree requirements are for what you're working on. Um, and it will really enrich your life. It'll help us um, solve some of these problems and we'll, we should all be better off for it. So again, thank you again. Um, okay. Thank you very much, Prof. Gary. Uh, I really highlight the sentence, go further and beyond, and also get involved to solve the issue. So before we end this session, um, I would like to summarize some important points. 
that we already know that water management, water quality is one of our approach to getting sustainability, but also we getting challenge of water management and also access air and unmatched water management and also water scarcity, climate change and others. So we're facing a global water issues. So how we can to uh, solve it, uh, we have to increase the sustainability with everything. We also have to believe that we are part of the job to solve the the problems and also go further and beyond to solve the water issue in global. So once again, thank you very much, Prof. Gary. Please give us a, a proud applause for Prof. Gary for such interesting. And also, if you would like to contact uh, further to Prof. Gary, you can uh, chat uh, through email, right? You mentioned the email in the chats. And also, as our appreci appreciation and highly acknowledge, we would like to give us online certificate for Prof. Gary. So the host, please. Wait. Okay, once again, thank you very much, Prof. Gary, for your insightful presentation and really appreciate your effort to support our um, summer course. Thank you so much. Uh, the pleasure was all mine. And I wish you uh, I wish you a good course in the, over the next few days. Thank you very much, Prof. Gary. So I think this is the end of the sessions. Once again, thank you very much, Prof. Gary. And um, I'm as a moderator today. Uh, we'll giving the time back to the master of ceremony. Okay. Thank you so much, Professor Giri, for the insightful materials of this morning here in Indonesia. Also, good evening for you. And then we will also give a certificate of appreciation to our moderator today that have been lead our uh, discussions. The certificate will be given by our head of the summer course, Dr. Agung Putra Pamungkas. Please come to the stage of our Dr. Priska. Uh, yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. So the first session now has finished. Uh, I would like to remind all the participants to fill the attendance form by scanning the QR code for the committee. Please show the QR code. Hanif, you are. And after this, we will have break time for the coffee break for about 30 minutes in the first floor, the same room as yesterday. Please eat wisely and to prevent food waste, of course. And please come back to this room before 10.15 to have another session. Uh, we will have sessions with Professor Kihiryu from the Seoul National University. Um, so for the participants, for the on-site participants, you can go for a coffee break. And for the online participants, you may stay in the Zoom meeting and have some uh, little time for break. And please come back to the meeting room or, or the meeting Zoom meeting at 10, before 10.15. Okay, thank you. <laughs>